Welcome to your next lesson, Chemistry Stars, called the Periodic Table. Our journey continues in our second module, Learning the Language of Chemistry. Remember, the tool page you should have out in front of you is a periodic table. We will be taking notes directly on that, so just wanted to be sure that you had access to that. And as we begin looking over the periodic table, wrong slide, we're going to define that term first. Notice here that we're writing into our notepad then just an arrangement of the elements in rows and in columns. We don't need to do that. An arrangement of the elements in rows and in columns according to the similarities of their periodic properties. So again, I'm just going to go back and take a quick peek. Notice that we have columns on the periodic table and notice that we have rows on the periodic table. That's what we're referring to as just an organization of the periodic table. So defining it, it arranges the elements in rows and columns according to their properties. Notice that there is an arrangement according to their atomic number. As we read from left to right, we increase the atomic number by one, which means increasing proton number by one. We know atomic number gives the element its identity. The groups on the periodic table are the columns, or sometimes known as families, columns of elements, and they're given these letters as well as a number. The letter is a group A or a group B. Let's talk about group A elements first. The group A elements are the tall columns to either side of the periodic table. The vocabulary word given to these group A elements are known as representative elements. The representative elements represent their valence electrons. The number of electrons in the outermost energy level. Remember that those are the ones that are most interesting to the chemist. They're the ones available to do bonding and form compounds. So the outermost energy level, called valence electrons, are represented by the location in which those elements live. Now let's take a quick peek at the periodic table just to be sure you're seeing what I'm referring to. Back to the periodic table. The representative elements are the following. Hydrogen's family, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium on down, are called the group 1A elements. Beryllium's family, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, radium, those are known as the group 2A representative elements. They represent their number of valence electrons. Beryllium has two electrons in its outermost energy level. Lithium has one valence electron in its outermost energy level. That's why they live where they live. Hop over the shorties in the middle and let's find the next tall column. Boron is in group 3A, boron's family, represents three valence electrons. Carbon's family is group 4A. Nitrogen is in group 5A. Oxygen's family, group 6A. Fluorine's family is group 7A. And helium's family, called those noble gases, erase that, is in group 8A. The A elements represent their valence electrons. The group A are the tall columns to either side of the periodic table. They are known as the representative elements. What about the group B elements? Well, they're the ones we hopped over, aren't they? They're located in the center of the periodic table. They're the short columns in the middle. They are known as the transition elements sometimes for, referred to as the transition metals. The reason they're referred to as the transition metals, they can vary the charge they form when they make an ion. In other words, we cannot look 
and know by their location the number of electrons that they're willing to lose or gain to form an ion. They have a variable charge. Any element with a variable charge when forming an ion, which we'll talk about in depth in a much, uh, you know, in a later lesson, but just kind of laying a strong foundation, these transition metals vary their charge because they the transition of those outermost electrons are able to move around and form more than one kind of charge. Now let's take a look at the periodic table just to be sure we see where these are located and mark them with me on your periodic table. After the group 2A family, we arrive at group 3, but it's a letter B. 3B is scandium and yttrium, and then down here, of course, we go to the 57 and 89 down here in lanthanide and actinide series. I'm going to leave those away. This is group 4B, titanium's family. Group 5B is uh, vanadium's family. Chromium is group 6B. Manganese, group 7B. And now do this with me. Iron, cobalt, and nickel are all lumped together as group 8B. All three of those columns are assigned group 8B. Now we go back and find copper's family as 1B and zinc's family as 2B. We have labeled the tall columns as the representative elements. There are eight tall columns. We have also labeled eight group B called the transition metals. We have our periodic table divided into columns or families based on the categories of A and B. What about the periods on the periodic table? Well, those of course are the rows as we read across. There are seven periods on the periodic table and let's make sure we take a look at those now and we'll number those. Back to the periodic table, we see, and I'm going to change color, row one, hydrogen helium, the first period. Row two, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon on through neon is in period two. Sodium's row, sodium, magnesium, aluminum is period three. Potassium's row, as we read across, period four. Rubidium's row, period five. Cesium is period six, and francium, period seven. Make a note with me now also, remember when we hit 57? It brings us down to the lanthanide series. Now imagine, if you will, this entire row is inserted into this one little box, making this particular region of the periodic table push way down. We just take them out and place them below to make it an easier format to read. The lanthanide series is still in period six, and the actinide series are in period seven. Notice that the name of the row just comes from the element that's starting the row. The lanthanide series comes from the element La. Actinide series comes from the element Ac, actinium. So the periods on the periodic table have been numbered and we know that those are rows. Where do the metals and nonmetals get placed on the periodic table? Well, let's locate those by drawing a line that separates the metals from the nonmetals. And so back to the periodic table, I want to make sure I go back here and I want you to do the following with me. Let me make it in a red pen. Between boron and aluminum, between aluminum and silicon, silicon germanium, germanium arsenic, I'm going to continue this row, this kind of creating a staircase all the way down. And I'm going to tell you that these particular elements, these are um, unnatural man-made elements, so we will really never refer to those, but I want you to draw a line, and now what you have done is separated the metals to the left of that staircase, 
and the non-metals to the right of that staircase. You can see in terms of abundance there are many many more metals than there are non-metals on this side of the staircase. So taking a look at the location of where metals and non-metals reside, we have drawn a staircase, kind of a line that separates the two. Those metals have high luster when clean, because metals will oxidize or tarnish readily left open to air. They're very good conductors of electricity as well. Metals are shiny, they're malleable, which means they can be pulled into wire, ductile is that word, hammered into sheets. Sometimes you hear ductile and malleable as terms referring to characteristics or qualities of metal. Ductile is drawn into wire, malleable, hammered into a sheet. They're very shiny when clean and excellent conductors of electricity. Nonmetals, of course, are the opposite Everything I just said about metals is the opposite is true for the nonmetals. So they are not shiny and very poor conductors of electricity. Of course, there are elements in the middle called metalloids, and I've heard some people refer to them as semi-metals, that have qualities of both metals and nonmetals. So it's not really a clear line separating the world of metallic substances from non-metallic substances. We have these tweener elements that have qualities of both. Let's locate them and put a little shade mark, if you will, just somehow on your periodic table so that you know you're looking at a metalloid. Back to the periodic table and I'll use a little purple mark. The first metalloid I'd like you to shade is the element for boron. The next one I'd like you to shade is the element silicon. I'd also like you to shade germanium and arsenic, antimony and tellurium, polonium and astatine. The definition of a metalloid, an element that has a full side touching the staircase a full side on the periodic table of its symbol is attached to the staircase. You notice that one exception we did not shade? It's aluminum. Aluminum is a rule breaker. Even though it has two sides touching the staircase, it is a metal through and through. So do not shade aluminum. We've had boron, silicon germanium, arsenic antimony, tellurium, polonium, astatine, and again, these synthetic elements will leave off. Metalloids have qualities of both. There we go. Let's talk about naming those columns as well. Locate the first family, group 1A, not hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a metal. It's also a rule breaker. Hydrogen is a non-metal placed in column number one because it has one valence electron, just like all of the members of that same column, but it is not a metal. It is a non-metal as a gas at room temperature. So the group 1A metals, known as the alkali metals, actually begin with the element lithium. Alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. Not hydrogen. Hydrogen is a non-metal, but it still belongs in group 1A based on representing its valence electron. But lithium begins the metallic family. We have a second family known as the alkaline earth metals, group 2A. Group 7A are known as the halogens, and group 8A are known as the noble gas. Sometimes they're called inert gases. They have their outermost electron energy filled, and so they're unreactive. Inert means to not react. 
We should know the names of group 1A, starting with lithium, is the alkali metals. Group 2A, starting with, and again, I can go through here and show. Lithium alkali metals, beryllium's family, the alkaline earth metals. Over here are the halogens, fluorine's family, and the noble gases. And friends, just so you know that every one of these families has a specific name to them. We're just not required to know all of the names. About those bottom two rows, how we labeled them, we want to remember what they're called, the lanthanide and the actinide series, just simply named after the elements that start their rows, lanthanum and actinium, and they belong in periods six and seven, respectively. To show what I'm saying, row six is the lanthanide series, row seven is the actinide series, they do not have group numbers, no group numbers, but they do belong to periods six and seven. The lanthanide and actinide series on the periodic table are the bottom two rows. Just make sure I back that screen up so you've got all that captured there. We made a mention of this earlier that by Far, there are more metallic elements. About 80% of all the elements are metals. All metals are solid at room temperature, but there is one exception, and that exception is the element mercury. Have you ever seen a mercury thermometer? That silvery liquid inside is the element mercury. So the element mercury, symbol HG, is a liquid metal like in the Terminator movie, how they had Mercury representing the Terminator as he was um, being melted and formed back into various shapes. All the others are solids. Well, let's tackle a little review with the periodic table. So with your chart, you may pause the video right now and work through this review and start the video back up when ready to check your work. Welcome back. Let's check our answers together. In terms of finding each of the elements, that just takes practice. The more you stare down the periodic table, the faster you become. So we're going to identify each as an, a metal, metalloid, or a nonmetal. The element gold, AU, is its symbol. AU, we know, is a metal. Letter B is silicon. Its elemental symbol is SI. We wrote that as a metalloid. It was one of the ones we shaded. Manganese is the elemental symbol MN. It is a metal. Sulfur has the elemental symbol S. We know that as a nonmetal. And barium, with its elemental symbol BA, falls in the land of metals. While we were finding those, which of these elements are representative elements? In other words, which ones were group A elements? Well, checking out gold, AU, gold actually lives in the column of 1B, so it is not a representative, it's a transition element. Group B, or I'm sorry, letter B was silicon. When you found silicon, it lived in the group of 4A. That is a group A element, so it is indeed a representative element. Letter C was the element manganese. When you found manganese, you found it resided in the group called 7B, so we labeled that as a transition element. Letter D was the element sulfur. It was found in group 6A. Therefore, we know it to be a representative element. And barium, BA, it was located in group 2A, the second tall column there over on the left. Since it's an A in a tall column, we call that a representative element. Any element in group a represents their valence electrons. Your third review question, 
Give the symbol of each of the element that fits the description. Well, let's locate group 4A. Group 4A is Carbon's family. In this particular family, I'll list them. We see carbon, underneath it is silicon, underneath that is germanium, underneath that is tin, followed by lead. Of these, which are the non-metals? Well here, carbon is the only non-metal with silicon, that is a metalloid, germanium, tin, and lead, are all metals. So the only element fitting the description is carbon. Letter B, the inner transition metal. Well, the inner transition metal refers to the lanthanide and actinide series. The lanthanide series begins with number 57, and that's the element La lanthanium. Which two elements are liquids at room temperature? Well, this one we might have a color coding periodic table to help us. We talked about mercury as being a metal that is a liquid at room temperature. And maybe you know that bromine is the non-metal that's a liquid at room temperature. But mercury and bromine are the only two elements that exist as liquids at room temperature. And the last one to review any metal in group 5A, well just to remind ourselves, this is nitrogen's family. So out of nitrogen's family, we have nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth. The metal, well let's see, nitrogen is a non-metal, phosphorus is a non-metal, arsenic is a metalloid, so underneath that, we still have antimony as a metalloid, and so the only one left is bismuth. Check that out with me on this periodic table, group 5A. Non-metal, non-metal, metalloid, metalloid, metal. trying to find my spot. There we are. How did you do? Did you have any mistakes that needed to be corrected? Well, let's keep challenging ourselves. This is a, a fill in the table, which is a popular way to, for an assessment to appear. We have the element, symbol, proton number, neutron number, electron number, mass number, and atomic number. Let's remember our definitions. By definition, atomic number is the proton number. So I understand atomic number and proton number will always be the same. And I understand that the number of electrons must match because atoms are neutral. The other definition to remember, a mass number is defined as the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So we can deduce the number of neutrons once we know the mass number, or vice versa. Let's model one. Find calcium. Calcium is in group 2A in period 4. Its atomic number is 20. The symbol, Ca. The number of protons is 20. I know that because it's number 20 on the periodic table. Now fill in what else we know. 20 protons means 20 electrons. By definition, 20 is the atomic number. So thinking about the isotopic symbol, 20 is the atomic number. Now notice the number of neutrons given to us. When I add 20 plus 20, we get 40 as its mass number, the sum of protons and neutrons. Look right above calcium on the periodic table and you find the elemental symbol Mg. That stands for the element magnesium. Do you see that its atomic number is listed as 12? 
So now I know 12 protons, electrons, and atomic number. The elemental symbol Mg with the atomic number 12. Notice the mass number was provided, so I know that the total weight of all the particles inside would be 24. And to find those neutrons, I'm going to subtract 24 from 12, and we find 12 neutral neutrons. The next column, or the next row I should say, going across, gives me one important piece of information, and that's the number of protons. It's number 53. So off to the periodic table you go to find number 53. Do you see it? It comes from the element called iodine with an elemental symbol of a capital I. The elemental symbol I is number 53 on the periodic table, iodine. Since it is neutral, 53, I also know the number of electrons and therefore the atomic number. Those columns are always the same. If we know the neutrons are 76 and we know the protons are 53, I'm going to add those together to find the mass number of 129. Now remember, this may or may not, not match what you're seeing on the periodic table because the, on the periodic table is the average of all the isotopes. So we just want to be sure we write down the sum, always a whole number, the sum of protons and neutrons for this column. And one more. Number of electrons gives me the identity because it also matches the protons. So if I know that there's 16 electrons, I know there's 16 protons, and I know it's number 16. Let's find it. Who's number 16 on the periodic table? Well, that's sulfur. So I've identified sulfur because I knew it's number of neutral 16 electrons, 16 protons. Now look at the mass numbers given also is 31. So to find the neutrons, I have to subtract. 11 minus 6 is 5, 2 from 1, there's 15 neutrons. Good work. We practice isotopic symbols and the really just basic atomic structure skills for that particular question. We're going to draw some Bohr models or simple models of the atom starting with phosphorus. I'm going to go to the periodic table and find phosphorus. Its elemental symbol is P, and its atomic number is 15. Now let's just take the closest whole number. Now I see that the mass number is given as 30.974. That's the average of all of the isotopes together. We call that the atomic mass. So let's just round to make the isotope, the nearest whole number, as 31. So by definition, I know that there's 15 positive protons. 31 minus 15 is 16 neutral neutrons, so that the sum of the particles matches the 31. Let's go to work with our periodic table. What period does phosphorus live in? The period is period 3. That tells me I have three energy levels. That's why it lives where it lives, three energy levels. I know the first fills with two. Eight more fills the second for our electron distribution. And now let's figure out its group number for this representative element is in group 5A. That tells me there's five electrons in the outermost energy level. It represents its valence electrons. 2 plus 8 is 10, plus 5 more is 15, and yep, we've neutralized the positive charges. That's the simple model of a phosphorus atom. Same skill for potassium, very quickly now. Potassium is number 19. On the periodic table, I read 39.098 as its atomic mass the average of all of the isotopes together. Let's take the nearest whole number and form an isotope of potassium 39. 
That tells me 19 positive protons by definition. 39 minus 19 is 20 neutral neutrons. So the sum of all the particles in the nucleus gives me the 39. The period for potassium, it's in period four. Fourth row down, that tells me there's four energy levels. That's why it lives where it lives. So I know to go one, two, three, four. And in my head, these are rings going around. I know the first energy level fills with two electrons. That's hydrogen, helium. The second row on the periodic table has eight spots. Third row on the periodic table has eight more elements until you reach the end of the row. And now, remember it's group number. The group number potassium lives in is 1A. There's one valence electron, one electron in the outermost energy level. 2 plus 8 is 10, plus 8 more is 18, plus 1 is 19 electrons, neutralizing the 19 positives in this electron distribution. Perfect work. I hope this is becoming easier with continued practice. We're going to stop the video here and allow you to process and practice some periodic table skills.